what's up? I'm the African Caesar. We're in a basketball court at One Campus Marshes, the home of Quicken Loans. And we're here today to talk to my man, Josh Luber from Campus. All right, so if you don't know, Campus just got invested by Dan Gilbert. The down here in Detroit, it's a big move, especially for sneakerheads like everywhere. Particularly this guy because he's the founder of Campless. Um, before we get started, um, just to get little people a little bit of insight, um, what's your background and what made you start Campless? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think like a lot of us, right? I mean, I've collected sneakers all my life. Right. And um, once I got to you know working, I. I I founded and ran a couple startups, and so I was like a startup guy, but none of them had anything to do with sneakers. Right. Uh, almost intentionally so, almost like I didn't want to create a job that was just an excuse to play with sneakers all day, right? I play with sneakers all day at home. Right. So, uh, and so I kind of avoided it, and um, and I shut down startups, and I actually went to work for IBM, which I never thought I would do, but I go to work for IBM as a consultant, and I started doing all this data analysis, and I was doing all this data work at IBM, and I thought, I wonder what sneaker data is out there. I wonder if I could just, you know, for fun, just to get hold of, because I was doing it for work. And so we know that you know eBay is the, the largest speaker marketplace. Right. So we started with eBay and said, so can we get a hold of eBay data? You know, what can we do with it? And that's how it started. And it was really just, can I create a price guide? Can I can I look at eBay data and have anything that comes out of it that's interesting and then share it with other people I know that collect sneakers? Wow, that's it's just funny how you just started from one place and was dealing with all the data for one thing, and the idea just sparked this is nuts. Yeah. Um, obviously you're the founder. Um, were there other people involved in helping you getting this whole thing started? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. So um, on day one, it was just myself and one of my uh, co-founders from my other startups. Uh, he's on the technical side. I'm certainly not um, you know, a programmer. I, I'm not a developer. And so he helped me figure out how to tap into eBay's API, how to bring in that data into uh, a format that I could play with it and use it. And what happened was after doing a little bit of data work, creating some version of a price guide, we started blogging about it, and we started tweeting about it, kind of putting things out there just to see if anyone was interested in the stuff that, that I was doing. And sure enough, um, there were. Uh, you know, the sticker, you know, we talk about it, is that community and a culture or whatever, but there's a lot of people and everyone right. has different interests, right? right? And within all the people like sneakers, you know, some people like basketball, some right. people like hip hop, well, like some very small slice really like data and analytics. Right. And so once I put it out there, it really hit those people hard and they started emailing me or, or DMing me and saying, you know, hey, I, I love what you're doing. I love sneakers and data. Can I help? Right. And I was like, sure. You know, so uh, people just yeah. volunteer. Just yeah, I mean, I never thought that I was going to build campus uh, with volunteers or with, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was just kind of right. doing it. And to my surprise, people started saying, you know, I just want to be involved. I just want to help you do this because I love sneakers because they kind of saw that we were creating something different and wanted to be a part of it. And over the next three years, um, we ended up working with 17 uh, people, volunteers, who um, frankly were in a lot of cases way overqualified to do this. They were you know, great computer programmers or great designers uh, or uh, data people and they would all help in different ways. Right. And you know I mean it was all on the side. So it was like you know whatever you can do whatever you can help. And it was really about finding the people that were in it for the right reason. There right. could have been more. We could have had way more than, than that um, involved. But we only wanted people that just wanted to do this to create something for the sneaker community, and then whatever happened, happened. Right. So it was pretty lucky that to have that. I think that's one of the most unspoken things about the sneaker community is how when there's a great idea or there's something special that could be made, how we all come together and make sure it gets done. So I don't think you see that in too many other uh, genres. I, I agree 100%. I think the support that sneakerheads have for each other, you know, there's any, there's a lot of hate on Twitter and, and you know. stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, most people really just want to see the entire community lifted up and, and are happy for the success of other people. I agree. So, and that, that's been good. They want to see the community get showcased and they kind Absolutely. of feel like it's been yeah, kind yeah. of hidden for the most part. Look, I mean, you and I were about the same age. I'm sure you went through that same thing, oh, you know, yeah. 10 years ago when everyone's like, why the hell do you have 80 pairs of sneakers in your closet? Yep. Everyone looks at you like three heads and you're like, uh, you my wife still looks at me like that. No, no. Yeah, well, yeah, mine too, right? But <laughs> at least she understands it a little bit more. Right. Right. But as this, as our community grew, as more people came into it, as more mainstream media started sort of shining a light on this, for better or for worse, it at least made it less weird, right? right. It made it, you know, and so that was cool. Uh, um, so for those who may not know, uh, what is Campus? How would you describe it? 
the most basic level, Campus is the Kelly Blue Book for sneakers. Right. We are a price guide. We are a price guide based on real data. Um, many sneakerheads, myself included, you know, we've been around long enough. You kind of know uh, that's about a three hundred hour shoe or, or whatever. And for years, it was always like that. So we're like, well, why can't we just figure out from data what it is? And we right. collect right now. We're, we have over twenty five million eBay auctions within our database, and we collect data from all the places too. But We've done a lot more and there's a lot more to it, but at the most basic level, it's the Kelly Blue Book for sneakers, right? On top of that, it's information about sneakers. It is data, it is information that allows people to either use it to better buy and sell sneakers or just use it for their own interest because it's interesting stuff to look at and, and it's you know, not a real well. So. I agree. A lot of the stuff, like you said, has to do with um, statistics, data, analytics. Um, what was that process like, gathering all that information? Because I heard you looked at 22 million eBay auctions. Yeah, so it, it the first step was easier than I thought. Getting a hold of the eBay data was easier than I thought because eBay has an open API. It's okay. something that is, is available that, um, frankly, anyone can tap into it and, and start to, to collect it. I mean, we've been doing it for three and a half years, so. Right. Um, but the second part was way harder than I thought, which is that, and I'm sure everyone can, can relate to this, right? In an eBay auction, there's all sorts of noise. There's all sorts of random keywords. So people will write, you know, Jordan 6 Carmine, and then it'll say Yeezy, Kobe, LeBron, and like 19 other things in the title, right? And so because of that, it's really hard to figure out like what sneaker is actually being sold in that auction. Right. And that's what um, we spent more time doing than anything else, was cleaning those auctions, cleaning that data, so I could know exactly what sneaker was that. You know, was it a Jordan 6 Carmine, or was it a Yeezy Boost, or was it whatever else? Um, and then from there, it's, you know, it, it gets a lot easier again, it's really you know, a lot of math, but um, that is a function of what the community is built on eBay and eBay itself and right. its platform, you know, people type in whatever they want. Right. So when they want the, it's a pop. So everyone puts easy at the end of every sticker auction. Because they want more people to see it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so we had to deal with that. So that was the, big, the biggest challenge. How tedious was that process? Pretty, pretty tedious. Um, yeah. You know, it uh, is very manual. Right. And most people don't understand that in really all data companies, um, there's a lot of really manual kind of grunt work that goes into it. And the best example of that is, uh, is Pandora. So you know with Pandora, right? It's the internet yeah. radio. Yeah. So the way Pandora got started, which not as many people know, is that they literally took CDs and loaded every single song in the entire universe you know, into their database. Wow. Right? And then they start tagging and start doing all the things as, as people use it to, to make it smart and all the things that they do today, but like they had to get those songs in the database to begin with, right. and they literally sat down, I don't know how many people, and just thousands of CDs and loading them all in and doing and like, right, and then you build the data stuff on top of that of once you actually have them, and it's a very apt analogy, it's the same thing, it was like we had to clean all this eBay data, and we had to get it good so we knew what it was, and then we can do lots of cool stuff with it once we have that. Right. In the course of getting all this data and analytics and stuff, was there anything that popped out and surprised you about the market yeah so um, the biggest surprise was that eBay prices aren't as bad as people think and we actually wrote a post a while ago that was called uh, eBay prices are a lot better than you think right. and the reason why is and logically it makes sense is that any given day you go to eBay and you just open it up and see what's listed there That's right. well if a shoe's price really good and mm -hmm. forget about fakes and forget about all that stuff but if, it, if it's a good price right someone's selling it for, for 50 bucks less than the market they just want to get rid of it so that shoe's going to get bought like that right, right. someone's going to jump on that as soon as they see it right. so it's not going to be sitting there for a long time but if something's overpriced if someone's asking way too much for something it's going to sit there no one's going to buy it exactly. so anytime you go to ebay most of the stuff you see is overpriced and it's been sitting there and so it gives this perception that sneaker prices uh, are a lot higher because people you know people don't you can't see that what right. people pay for it right. you can't see the ended options all you can see is what's available right, right. and so we did a lot of work and we you know, compared different things. We compared closed options to listings that were still there. And, and we found that there's actually a, a big, there's a gap. There's a gap between perception and reality that eBay prices are better than the people think they are. They're not as bad. Because look, if someone is pricing a pair of, you know, we'll use Jordan 6 Carmine and they have it up there for $900, that shit's going to sit forever. No one is ever going to buy that, right? And then someone is going to be like, oh, people are selling Jordan 6 Carmines for $900. Right. They're not. Just one idiot's trying to ask for it, right? right. No one's going to pay it. Exactly. So, yeah. All right.
right. So um, because recently you guys have it to where people can post their collections on campus and get an idea of the value of their collections. Yeah. How's that process even? Yeah. So this has been by far the most requested feature um, that we've had and the thing that we've wanted to do the longest, right? right? So if we're a price guide, if we know the value, we can go there and see the price of any one shoe. Well, it makes sense to be able to put that together and say, well, what are the you know hundred shoes that you have and what that's worth? So it's like a natural extension. It's a it's okay. a natural extension. It was something that even from day one I always thought this is what we're going to do. Right. So the concept of the collections is the same thing as like a stock portfolio. It's like here's all your shoes, here's the value of it. You can see how the value changes over time. You can compare it to other people and say, you know, my collection has the most pairs or my collection right. has the most value. Um, and then there's all sorts of other data that comes along with that that is not unlike if you were to go to like a Schwab online brokerage account and see people's stocks and bonds and whatever that is. Right. And obviously it's not nearly as, as, uh, as complex, but at the most basic level, now you can have a profile on there. So you can create your collection right. and you can see, so you know, my collection's worth, I don't know, $50,000 or $100,000 and, right. and play around with it. And, and it's just a fun thing to do, but um, we've had phenomenal feedback from people that said, you know, I've wanted to do this forever. And um, I personally used to keep like an Excel spreadsheet where I kind of used to like just put in like what I paid for a shoe. Right. And you know, I didn't really know what it was worth before we started doing campus, right. just to kind of track that. And so the same thing on campus, you can put in, well, I paid retail and then it'll just give you a retail price, right. or I paid X and whatever. And then you can track by shoe, you know, how much money have I made on that shoe? How much money have I made on that shoe? Right. Almost like each one's a stock. And it's like just a fun thing to do, but also it's useful. It just seems like something somebody would have came up with before. Like it just seems so simple. Like it's, it's crazy. Well, um, well and for people and, and other companies tried to build the concept of collections um, on websites, but there wasn't the data with it. And so there's only so much you can do once you say, all right, I'm going to put my collection on like Sneakerpedia used to be that where I put all my shoes up there. Well, then you've uploaded all pictures. Well, now what? It's exactly. just some pictures of it. And then you're like, oh, well, that's okay. And you never come back to it because there's, <laughs> there's no right. like, engagement. Like, right. And this was the thing. It was like, we felt like if you gave people the data, well, then it, there's a reason to actually like use this thing more often and update it and get a new pair of shoes. And this serves a purpose. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it's like anything else. Like, you know, the idea itself isn't new, but it's like our thing was like, well, we're going to put data and, and, and execute it a little bit better. We hope. All right. So, got Dan Gil. Owner of Click and Loans and of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. Um, he's investing all out throughout Detroit. What was it like? First of all, how did you guys even meet? What was it like when he finally came to you and said he wanted to invest it in your business? Yeah, um, I never imagined that I would end up here or work with Dan. Um, we talked to a lot of people in all areas of the sneaker world, whether they were the blogs or the retailers or the resellers or the brands, um, eBay, and lots of people within the sneaker industry. And so um, Dan was never part of the sneaker industry. This wasn't, he wasn't, uh, you know, in that uh, list. And um, and one day some guys who worked for him approached me, um, you know, they approached me and said they were interested in talking to me, just like a lot of people had approached me and said they were interested in talking to me. And, um, you know, kind of like one thing leads to the next. And um, what comes out of that is the opportunity to partner with um, a person, an organization, a uh, business that sees the larger potential in campus. Right. right. It wasn't just about, you know, how do we make a better price guide or, you know, or, or even how do we make, you know, collections. It was this concept that the methodology and what we've done at campus could be applicable to a lot of other places. There's a lot of other uh areas of, of commerce, areas of, of the world where just using data in a better way, in a more interesting way, has broader potential. And I think of, of everything, you know, that was kind of what Dan and his people saw in this. As, um, as you know, they're constantly um, investing in startups and other businesses here and bringing right. people to Detroit to grow both Detroit, you know, the business community and also right. you know, itself. And, it, you know, I think campus kind of met a lot of those uh, check boxes of, of things that right. helped grow the whole thing. And so um, it was a very unforeseen and crazy thing, but it fit really well together. It was a, it was a great you know, opportunity. Are you surprised by, I know I am, are you surprised by how uh, serious that other business people are taking, like the sneaker culture, 
Because before it was just kind of like, okay, like my kids buy shoes. But now yeah. it seems that more and more people are wanting to get involved in sneaker culture because they see the benefits. And they see the money that, that's going through it, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, for better or for worse, I'll take a little bit of that blame. I, I think I personally started seeing it more the first time we sized the market. We put out that the market was about a billion dollars. Uh, and then a lot of people started, you know, their ears started to perk up. And uh, that's when we got calls from, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and other people who wanted to use that data, particularly that data point in their uh, reporting on the secondary market. Because, you know, you and I know that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the only stories mainstream media ever did on sneakers was like, Violence, uh, yeah. right? Uh, about sneakers, uh, right? Which like sucked because like sure that actually happened and, and you know you can't get away from that. But like there was a lot more to it, right? There's like and so now it, it opened the eyes of a lot of other people. And so there are some people that have tried to get into sneakers for the wrong reason. You know, they see money and there's a the opportunity. There's other people that are legitimately either interested or have tangential businesses that would make sense that they were just exposed to it because of that. And I think Dan falls in that, that latter category for sure. Right. Um, and then, you know, the sort of the other applications of campus. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing going on. I think it was you and later on Forbes, as a matter of fact, Matt Powell, he's really into uh, the whole sneaker market. Mm -hmm. um, but I think both of you pointed out that in the last 30 years, like sneakers at their worst at Plateau, they have been the one trend that's been constantly going up. In the last 30 years, that's, that's saying a lot. Yeah, and right now it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next, you know, X number of years with right. sneakers. Um, you know, we had this hyper growth when all these new sneakerheads are coming in the last five years, and right. Nike was pumping out more and more shoes, mm -hmm. um, and it slowed down. So right now, in the past you know, six months or so, like the overall sneaker market has been about flat. You know, yeah. it's not really going down, but it, well, it's you couldn't you couldn't possibly keep that rate of growth up anyway. Right. Um, and so we'll see. Like you know, Nike can always pump up the market more. You know, the more limited release stuff they put out, you know, they can always do that. Um, some of the sneakerhead market will shake out. Some of these resellers that are here just to make money, right? They're not sneakerheads. Right, right, right. Care Eventually, those guys shake out. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then it kind of goes up again. But each individual shoe always continues to go up in value for dead stock pairs exactly. because pairs, you know, get worn. Pairs get in the hands of people that want to own them. Mm -hmm. So there's only so many dead stock pairs available or that remain right. left. And usually what we see is like 18 to 24 months after release is usually where like prices start and then they start going up really high because sellers can get whatever they want right. because there's just so few dead stock pairs left, right? right? Okay, so you guys are giving away 73 pairs of shoes. Now that's in commemoration, uh, obviously, of Dan Gilbert's investment to your company, but why specifically 73 pairs? Yeah, so um, we, we went this before everything with Dan happened. Um, and so the timing was good, but um, we were going to do the same. We wanted to do something really big. And then we also didn't want to just make it like a round number, like what, what's like a fun number we can do. And it happened to be that when we launched collections and we launched this contest where we were giving away 73 pairs of stickers, the website had been up for 73 weeks. Right? Wow. So that was like, well, okay, 73 is the number. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, and then the way that we're doing the, the giveaway is we wanted to get you know real deep. We wanted to have you know, some pairs that are on you know, all worth a lot of money. And so um, we were able to go out and put together a, a range. And so there's a handful of pairs, like there's a pair of Don C's, there's a pair of Easy Boosts, there's a pair of Chrome Posits um, that are, you know, worth a lot of money. And then it goes all the way down to, there's a, you know, maybe five or six like GR pairs in there. And there's lots of stuff in between. Right. And so the way it'll work is it'll be like a draft lottery. So there's, there'll be 73 winners and you can earn entries in the contest by basically building your collection on campus. And you know, there's other ways but essentially you have to build a collection on campus to get entry into the contest. Right. Um, which it ends, um, it ends pretty soon, right? It yeah. ends on, on Thursday the 8th. Right. Um, so uh, entry to get in. But then we'll choose winners and whoever gets chosen first, they get their choice of one of 73. So that person might take the done seats, right? Whoever gets chosen second gets their next choice and so forth, right? So you get chosen 73, you get whatever's left over. Right. But either way, it's still a three pair of sneakers and it's still 73 pairs. So it's been a lot of fun to like, create that contest and put it together. And the coolest thing was, uh, we were fortunate to meet DJ Clark Kent 
and he said, well, let me, you know, contribute that too. Right. And so uh, he gave us a signed pair of Air Force One 112s right. uh, that are within that, that wow. contest. So that's like, that's just cool. Like so what's, the, what's the size one? Uh, they're all random, um, which, you know, makes it a little more, you know, tricky. So, you know, um, if you get chosen, you can choose something in your size. We have a, a wide range. Um, or you can just choose whatever you like the most or whatever happens to be the most valuable. So, um, yeah, it'll be random. But the Don so, happens to be an 80. Let me ask you this. So there was like a cool black dude, right? That just so happened to this collection up on campus. And he wears a size 15. Could y'all accommodate him? <laughs> It's possible. Okay. It's possible. Just want to know. Although, you know, friends and family are disqualified, so it depends on, you know, right. are we friends yet? I don't know. So. I think we are. It's like Step Brothers. <laughs> like, I think we just became best friends. Oh. It goes without saying, you're obviously a sneakerhead, right? Yeah. I know you, you know, you thought of this as a business, but do you see campus in some small way your contribution to the sneaker culture? Absolutely, right? I mean, for for three years, you know, this wasn't a business. Uh, right. For three years, this was just something we were doing for fun because we wanted to. And um, after, you know, after I realized there was something there, I was like, well, look, this is how I can, you know, be involved. I mean, I have sat on the sidelines for my entire life, right? I read all the sneaker blogs, and buy sneakers, but like, right. I've never, never been engaged. I've never started a blog. I've never tried to become a Twitter personality. I've never, you know, but like, this was, this was the thing. And I was like, you know, happen to be this overlap of I happen to have these data skills and I happen, you know, and I love sneakers. And so, you know, I was never going to create another blog and I never wanted to be a reseller. I never wanted, you know, it was like that. Right. So I was kind of just like a, a silent, which, you know, you and I know there's, However many people are on sneaker Twitter and everything else, right. there's tens of thousands of, of, of sneakerheads who just follow silently and, and yeah. you know and love sneakers just as much as we do. They just don't happen to have you know made it a career or, or get yep. involved. That's what's up. Um, so me being a sneakerhead, I would be remiss if I did not ask you this: top five sneakers of all time. Top five sneakers of all time. I assume you're asking like my personal, personal favorite. Five, top five, right? So. Today and uh, for the past, you know, couple months, I basically made the Lance Mountain white, Jordan One Lance Mountain white. Like that's my shoe. It's the only pair of shoes that I have more than one on. It's yeah. the only pair. I have five pairs. Why wow. wow, 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 five pairs? Uh, because I have one that I'm just gonna I just keep wearing, right? I'm right. not gonna take nail polish remover. I'm not gonna intentionally do that. I'm just right. gonna keep wearing and see if I can chip off the paint, etc. Right. Um, um, one pair that you know I will never wear because I've decided this is kind of like my. And then the other three, we'll see like how much I wear them, what I do with them. But I want to have the option because it's. I mean, what a cool concept! Like the paint and the that way they've done cool. that, like it's it's very cool. Right. So that's got to be like you know number one. Um, you know after that, like I gotta like choose the models. I would say like so I'm wearing a pair of, of Air Max DWs, which I think are, are just one of the coolest shoes and, and right. kind of just fall right outside that that you know Air Max one. Air Max 90, 95, like things. So I would take a, a pair of Air Max BWs. Um, Can I just say too, I, re I respect that answer because a lot of people will try to think of the hottest shoe instead of their own personal favorites. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just, you know, you gotta kind of wear what you like, but the other yeah. thing is like, you know, I'm 37 and married to kids, like I feel pretty <laughs> awkward like walking out. Like, can you imagine if I was wearing a Yeezy 750s? I would, that would be the most awkward thing ever, right? right. So yeah, I, I couldn't do that. But right. uh, I don't know what the next three are, but there's a um, there's a pair I want to mention, which is yeah, I have a pair of uh, Adidas that are a collaboration with the designer Emilio Pucci, which are like this green design, and it's I've never seen it anywhere else. I bought it in Hong Kong, and they're like the one pair of shoes in my collection that I'm like. They just have this like sentimental place with like right. cool shit. They're when I got them, they, you know, they're crazy and green and all this weird stuff. Um, and I wear them, and speaker heads don't know what they are. And then I have women come up to me like, "Oh, I love Gucci, I love that." And I'm like, "Maybe this is a weird, you know, like, thing." But like, <laughs> like that, I love that shoe, right? That's awesome. Right. Um, you know, and then yeah, I mean, really, any Jordan ones, you know, they just get more comfortable over time. Right. Like that. And then I have a lot of Air Max 90s. Yeah. Um, and then Air Tech Challenge 2, right? So I'm like an Agassi guy. Right. I have a lot of Air Tech Challenge 2. That's probably the shoe I have the most of. They rented a couple stuff. this year, too, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it was great when they put it all the colors and, and mm -hmm. the, the uh, um, 
the Grand Slam pack was great and all that. So I have a lot of those as well. So I think those are you know kind of top models of right. little pairs. So what's next? What's next for campus and for Josh? Um, well, look, I mean, we only launched collections two weeks ago, so we're right. really, you know, focused on getting that out there and getting it right. Look, the biggest thing we know is that we're limited by the shoes that are on campus. So, right. you know, you can build your collection, but if we only have 2,000 or so pairs on campus, so we need to keep getting more shoes right. on to make that useful. Right. And then how do we take that, you know, collections and, and things we're doing and create more value for sneakerheads to use the site and to, um, you know, whether it's whether it's data or whether it's functionality. So there needs to be a new mobile app soon. We're looking for another mobile developer. So you know, if there are any mobile developers out there, by all means, you know, hit us up. Um, and so that's the big thing. Keep building on that. Um, but you know, the medium to long term is. You know, there's some big ideas floating around here, and that's right. why it, it you know attracts you know a guy like Dan Gilbert, who's interested in investing in this company, um, because you know what we might be able to do in a the bigger thing is, you know, that's the fun part, right? It's, right. it's, it's big ideas. Let's see. Yeah. So you just heard the guy. Um, follow Campus on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, obviously, the website Campus.com. Um, the mobile app. Yeah, there's an iOS app right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're redoing that, uh, so there'll be a new version out soon. We don't have an Android yet. We've been trying Android developer stuff, man. Yeah, I heard. Any oh, Android developers out there, you know, let us know. <laughs> we need to, to pick that up. Man, I appreciate you. Thank Getting you very time. much. No, thanks for having me. This is great. Yes, thank you. So, um, like I said, check out Campless. Um, if you got a collection and you want to know the value of it, upload it on campless.com. Um, I'm African Caesar with Sneaker Bar Detroit. This is our interview with Campus.